Misty Valley Cooperative presents When We Were Gone Astray The paths of the world twist and turn, taking you to unexpected places. Welcome to the haunted town of Assembly, and to the strange lands around it. The days are growing shorter and the nights are chill. So put another log on the fire, find a comfortable chair, sit back, Relax. Listen. Chapter 12 Severance Fletch met Silver at the church door. It's not that cold, he said, eyeing Silver's gloves. Hands are giving me trouble, Silver explained. Not bad, but persistent. Fletch's look softened. Sorry, I haven't had any more trouble. Then he smiled. I'll pray very hard for you in church. I'm sure Jesus is sympathetic. I asked him about it at three o'clock this morning, said Silver. He just said, deal with it, brother, deal with it. They greeted people as they entered and sat in their usual left-hand pew. They checked the opening hymn and Fletch opened a roll of candy. Why do people eat lifesavers in church and nowhere else? Is it some kind of tradition? I think grandmothers keep them in their purses to occupy the infantry. Where's the rest of you? Did he decide to stay home? Yes, he's curled up in the comfy chair reading Ridley Walker. I think he didn't want to attract attention. Is he okay? He thinks he's in the way. I tried to get him to come to church instead of me, but he wouldn't do it. That stuff Josh told us about those glass jugs really upset him. He wanted to look at them, but I wouldn't let him. Dad put them in the barn. Where could they have come from, Silver? They weren't there when we went to look at the well. I asked Betsy about them when we had our talk last night, Silver said. She knows about things like that, bad memories used by evil people but she said we shouldn't destroy them. Do you talk with her most nights, about paraclete stuff? Yes, she wants to make sure I'll be ready when the time comes. How long have we got? Fletch asked. Two weeks. Later in the service, Fletch watched as Silver received the wine-damp wafer on his tongue, his gloved hands folded at the rail. He really believes this stuff, Fletch thought. It's not just church for him. A tendril of fear crept down his spine. Will it change him? Will I lose him? The hymn Betsy and Florence played was Land of Rest, but Fletch found little comfort in it. The walk from the church to the pastorium took little more than a minute, but it was always difficult for Fletch and Silva to disengage themselves from the congregation. Mark intervened signaling with a glance that they should go home and check on Fletch. They walked over to the house and entered the front hall, calling out when they discovered he was not in the parlor. Back here! His voice came from the kitchen. They entered to find him at the refrigerator. He turned, lifting a bottle of chocolate milk. We've got a visitor, he said quietly. He pointed to the rug by the door to the back porch. A girl crouched there, dressed in nothing but an embroidered shawl. She looked at them blankly, then suspiciously. In the next moment she had swayed to her feet and was turning the handle of the door. Wait, Fletch told her, they won't hurt you. The girl watched them, unmoving, until she noticed the bottle Fletch had left forgotten on the counter. Chocolate milk? she said in a voice like a rusty hinge. Fletch poured the milk into a glass and held it out. The girl crept along the wall until she could reach out and take the glass from his hand. She took several swallows, then paused, her eyes flickering over the three of them. Red boy, she said. Two red boys. She nodded, apparently satisfied. Silver boy. Are you the girl who stays under the bridge? Silver asked softly. The girl's eyes flicked toward him, but she didn't answer. 
Her name is Nellie. She's Betsy's sister, I think. At least that's what she says. Her sister? Fletch asked him. But she's just a girl. I might have misunderstood her, the other boy admitted. She calls her Little Betsy. He poured himself a glass of chocolate milk. How was church? By the time Mark and Betsy arrived, Nellie had eaten half a can of sardines, which she had arranged on a series of graham crackers. Her caution had given way to curiosity, followed by vagueness. She sat still, her eyes unfocused, not responding to their questions. Silver touched the side of her hand, and she tilted her head to one side. Bath, she murmured. Ninety-six rock. The front door opened, and Mark and Betsy came into the kitchen. Mark saw Nellie and paused, raising an eyebrow inquiringly. Betsy simply shook her head. We have a gathering, I see. Nellie looked up. Little Betsy? she said, pushing a graham cracker across the table toward her. Fish cookie. Fletch covered his mouth, trying to keep a straight face. When paying a call on young men, Betsy told her, it is considered appropriate to wear clothes. I'll get her something, Fletch offered. He disappeared into the laundry room and returned a few minutes later with jeans and a sweater from the dryer. Betsy took Nellie into the parlor and dressed her, while Fletch explained her presence to the others. She was down by the lake, he told them. I thought she was some kind of animal at first because of the way she moves, but then she stood up and I recognized her. She isn't shy, exactly, but she's definitely not used to people. She likes the stuff we gave her. Betsy returned to the kitchen, took a small brush from her purse, and began untangling the girl's hair. This is my sister Nellie, she told them, clothed and in her right mind. I am no more dead, Nellie said, as if that explained everything. I'm very glad to hear that, said Mark. We're just about to have a bite of dinner. The boys and I would be pleased if you and Betsy would stay. A bite, Nellie agreed. A bite, a bath, rock and roll. She looked at Betsy and grinned. She's progressed rapidly over the past month. She's learning to speak and write. In fact, her penmanship is controlled and beautiful. Betsy took a piece of paper from her purse and unfolded it, spreading it flat against the table. The sun has set, and the pond is still. No, John, she likes to be in the pond. James Murray made sang my lay. See how still she stands. When she wrote this, I thought the phrases seemed familiar. They're from lessons in our old McGuffey's reader, which she and I used at school when we were children. She likes the pond and water in general, and as you've seen, she's often very still. Two red boys, Nellie spoke up. See how still, how still. She seemed uncertain, and her eyes lost their sharp, attentive gleam. She stopped moving, except for her hand, which trembled as it gripped the glass. The trembling increased, becoming a vibration. There was a sudden pop and an abrupt explosion of milk and shattered glass. Mark stood up. He took hold of Nellie's wrist and carefully opened her fingers. She appeared uninjured. He took the cloth napkin from her plate and gently cleaned her hand. I'm sorry, Betsy said. Sometimes she freezes this way. It will pass in a few moments. She placed her hand on the girl's forearm and spoke to her softly. Nellie relaxed, her raised hand descending to the table, but it was Fletch to whom she looked rather than to her sister. Bad hat, she said, and after that she wouldn't speak again. Mark drove Betsy and Nellie home after dinner. The strange girl seemed to have lost her curiosity and awkward merriment, becoming withdrawn and silent, apparently overwhelmed by interacting with so many people. She was one of the girls Jarrett Harbor killed in the swamp, Fletch told them. Her grave is in the cemetery. 
they had brought in wood from the edge of the orchard to build a fire in the parlor, and Fletch used a hatchet to split some from a pile on the back porch. I've never actually built a fire, he confessed. We had gas logs in Atlanta, and Dad usually builds it here before I get home from school. Nothing to it, Silver assured him. You just build a house of sticks in the fireplace and then burn it down. As they watched, he spread a sheet of newspaper over the ashes, then placed a strip of kindling across it. Now you balance these two bits of wood on this one. Then you wrap up this chunk of lightered in paper, kind of like a Tootsie Roll. It goes here. Silver added crumpled paper, twigs, and pine cones, then placed a split log across the andirons. I'll bet you were really good with Lincoln Logs when you were a kid, Fletch told him. Yeah, said Silver, I even made my own. Silver, did you know Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin he built with his own hands? Silver poked him with a stick of kindling. Must have been a traveler. He struck a match and lit the edge of the piece of newspaper. The flames spread quickly, moving from place to place, then dwindled and died. Oops, said Fletch, observing from Silver's other side. Maybe it was Daniel Boone instead. Silver looked dismayed. I'm sitting between two critics, that's what's the matter. A pine cone flared, began burning brightly, and ignited the twigs around it. The kindling caught the flame, and in a minute the fire began to blaze. Smoke billowed into the room. Is the damper open? Silver asked. What's a damper? Silver reached up into the chimney, grasped something and pushed hard. There was a clank of metal, and the smoke began rising into the flue. Silver wiped his hands on his jeans. That's a damper. This is fun, said Fletch. Yeah, we're like pioneers. Silver grinned. City boys. He took off his socks and propped his feet on the hearth, resting his head in Fletch's lap. There's something sad and lost about Nellie, but she's funny, too. Did you try one of her fish cookies? They weren't that bad. Fletch looked at him mournfully. Hey, wrong lap. Shut up, said Fletch. Go fix the fire. They spent two hours between the hearth and the sofa, reading aloud to each other from Ridley Walker and tending the fire. Now and then, hearing their laughter, Mark would poke his head in at the parlor door, give them a bewildered smile, and return to his study. Liz arrived in the middle of the afternoon, bringing a bag of books Dwight Wills had left for Silver the week before. Silver spread them out on the hearth. Light in August. Look at that. As I lay dying. That one's supposed to be really weird. I've never read any Faulkner, said Fletch, but I like the covers. We read A Rose for Emily, Fletch reminded him. Did we? Oh, yeah, was that Faulkner? Liz looked down at them. I can't get over the two of you, she said. You're not exactly alike, but I still can't tell you apart. He's the foreigner, Fletch told her, tugging the other boy's hair. But he's adjusting well. We're invading, Fletch explained. Soon there'll be two of everyone, and then we'll take over the world. I almost believe you, Liz said. What do you call them, Silver? F1 and F2? I just call them both Fletch. It's safer. Fletch went to the fire and put on another log. We used up all the pine cones. I saw some on the ground near the orchard, Silver said. He picked up a basket. We need more apple wood as well. You can lead the expedition. The light was fading, and the evening air held the sharp bite of winter. They circled the veranda and set out for the orchard. It feels like snow, Fletch observed. Smells like it, too. He glanced at Silver. Didn't you tell me there would be snow before Christmas? It's not even Thanksgiving, Silver said, shivering. Maybe it's hitting early. Snow would be good, Fletch told them. We could roast sausages on the fire and drink Russian tea. Silver, you could teach us how to carve Lincoln logs and we could build a fort in the library and stay home from school. What about school? Silver asked. You can't both go. That's a point of contention between us. Maybe if... Silver held up his hand. Quiet. There's something there in the trees. 
some kind of animal. They stopped and listened. At first they saw nothing, only heard a sliding, scuffling sound. Then they could distinguish the creature's shape among the shadows. What could it be? Fletch asked. Looks like a rat to me, Fletch suggested. A rat? It's bigger than any rat I've ever seen, he frowned. Maybe it's some kind of foreign critter. I can smell a rat when I sees one, Fletch insisted. Guys, Silver pointed, it's advancing, and we don't have the cane poles. We should go back. The creature moved sluggishly, its eyes dull and unfocused, and Fletch wondered if it might be sick. Its filthy, matted coat scarcely resembled fur. As it drew nearer, he saw the wound in its side, trailing rags and bits of paper. Silver whispered, It's that thing Josh found, the gaff that Cotton made. Fletch stared at it. I thought Josh said it was dead. Didn't he bury it? Silver, don't touch it. Silver was bending down on one knee, putting out his hand in a gesture Fletch had seen before, on their first venture into the forest, when Silver had soothed an angry copperhead with the tips of his fingers. It's all right, he said. I'm not going to hurt you. The rat's lips pulled back, showing its razor-blade teeth. You are a rat, aren't you? A big blue rat. He spoke softly, as if pattering to a baby as his hand moved closer. The creature sniffed him. It made a sound which sounded almost like a question. A shadow appeared above them, took form and moved down. A man was there, his booted foot raised. The boot came down like a strike of lightning. The creature's back broke with an ugly cracking sound. Silver flew to his feet. The man stepped away, eyeing him cautiously. Silver Kendall. You, Silver whispered. Crowther Wills turned toward Fletch, and his eyes widened in surprise, finding not one crimson boy but two, and before he could move, they both had taken hold of his arms. Easy, boys, he said. I'm not here to fight. We are, Fletch said, and punched him hard in the mouth. Crowther's head snapped to one side with the force of the blow, just as another hit him full in the stomach. In the next moment he was free of their grasp and standing behind them. That's more like it, he gasped. You aren't such a sissy after all, not when there's two of you. Crowther doubled over, his hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. Then his hand slipped to his boot, and he stood, moving his arm in a swift, sweeping arc. A long, deep wound opened in Fletcher's throat. Blood fanned into the air, and Fletch fell without a sound. Silver and Fletch scrambled toward him, I'm proud of you, boys, truly proud. Crowther removed his hat and placed it on the ground at Fletch's feet. As he rose, he disappeared. Silver and Fletch tried to stop the bright pulsing jets of blood, but there seemed to be no end to the flood which soaked his clothing and spread across the ground. Their hands slipped uselessly as they sought pressure points, tried to tilt his head forward in an effort to close the wound. Don't! Fletch pleaded. The other boy tried to reply, but couldn't speak. As he looked up at them, his expression was more puzzled than frightened. He reached up as if trying to touch Fletch's face or Silver's. There was a spinning flash of brightness, and his hand closed on something invisible in the air, then fell to his side. Silver lifted him and strode swiftly to the kitchen porch, pausing only to kick in the door. Mark! he shouted. Mom! shock. Mark and Betsy sat together in the study. The others remained in the parlor with Fletch. You can have him for the paraclete, Mark told her. Anything you want, but you have to try to bring him back. Mark, he's beyond that, she touched him gently. He died out there before Silver could even bring him inside. Last winter in the hospital it was different. He had a heartbeat, and the machines were breathing for him. He's my son, Betsy. Yes. Mark had spent the evening walking back and forth, 
between his living son and his dead son, with the uncertain steps of a man moving through a nightmare. The small cluster of friends who had gathered made the parlour seem small, and everyone seemed to be in shock. Repeatedly, Doc Merritt had insisted on examining both boys, as if death were a contagion that might pass from one to the other, until Fletch finally waved him away. Each time Mark saw the still, cold face of the boy on the sofa, he remembered his laughter earlier in the day, as the three of them had sprawled there, tangled up like a trio of puppies, reading aloud to one another. Why hasn't he just disappeared, Betsy? And why is Doc afraid that our Fletch might die as well? I don't know, but I think it may be because this event isn't over. We are caught up in something which is yet to be resolved. That man, Crowther Wills, said Mark. Fletch and Silver told me he vanished. He just disappeared. Yes, he must have been in a hurry because he left his hat behind. She took Mark's hand. We need to take Fletch outside assembly. I don't mean a burial, at least not of the regular sort, not yet. Ferguson Banks has a place where he can be kept safe for a while. Outside assembly, Mark asked. There's a place beneath the old Baptist church in Winder. It isn't a crypt, exactly, but it's underground. No one else knows about it, and the church is empty. We can keep watch there until Doc gives us leave to bury him. But Betsy, his body will decay. She shook her head. I think not. Window Susanna Nelms knew that something terrible had happened, and she realized that it concerned Fletch. Did he get hurt again, Daddy, like at the Halloween carnival? Yes, honey, Doc told her, but I'm going to take care of him. Can I come with you? No, it's nearly bedtime. You stay with your mommy. After her bath, Susanna sat by the window overlooking the water wheel. From there she could see across the common garden to the lights of the distant pastorium. The window glass was cold, like winter time. She felt if she could just keep looking at the yellow square of light, she could help to make everything all right. A dark shape blocked her view as it ascended the water wheel. It caught the ledge outside and hung on. Susanna saw Nellie's face inches from her own. She unlocked the window and pushed it open, and the girl climbed into the room, her hair and clothing drenched from the stream. Red boy is dead, Nellie said. Susanna understood what she meant, and her lip began to tremble. Nellie came and held her. Though she was wet and cold from the water, the girl's embrace was gentle and protective. Susanna clung to her, unable to keep from sobbing. Nellie had something in her hand, keeping it out of reach. In her misery, Susanna didn't think to question her about it. It was a very long, very sharp kitchen knife. When We Were Gone Astray is produced by Misty Valley Cooperative. It is the second book of the Forked Ways. The text and audio book are copyright 2021 by Beaufar. All rights reserved.